But the challenge I think, and with that uh, feedback would be, um, I think when, if we as a sector just become critical of how we as a society spend money and try and pick holes in it, um, I think that's important, but we have to couch it in the view that actually it's a good thing that we're doing. Like, it's good that we as a society want to help people with methamphetamine addiction, even if like all yeah. the money goes there and everyone just goes, well, we're doing methamphetamine addiction and we're actually helping people with alcohol because that's how government and politics moves. <laughs> yeah. Um, so well done. Like, you know, for me, I'm like, <laughs> awesome. Put the money in there. Like, well done. Maybe we should consider like better government stru governance structures and evaluation for it. Or maybe we should put, you know, the next investment of tranche that you do, let's do it there. Like, um, starting from that perspective is like, because the alternative is, why do you give all this money, you know, coming from the set, why do you give all this money to the sector and how do you know like where it went? And if I'm a politician that doesn't give a shit about this stuff, I'm not going to go, oh, we should do that again. Like we're going to get yeah. like beaten up by people from the sector. Like, um, you know, like you, one, no, nah, well, let's just, you know, put our money in wind farms and you know, <laughs> coal mines and stuff like, you know, where then they're, they're not going to be critical of how we gave it. Yeah. Boom. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Real Drug Talk. Uh, excited today. We've got Chris Rains on the show, um, who has actually done a lot and in the alcohol and drug space in terms of what I think. It's, it's probably not now because the years have moved on, but at the time it was ve very much so bringing innovative... It has been. It has right. been. <laughs> bringing uh innovative services um into the into the aod space um and would you say probably with hello sunday morning which we'll talk about a bit was that sort of like the first app would you say in the alcohol and drug space in the in australia probably first big one anyway so. of any prominence i think yeah yeah i mean definitely um you know one of the first communities of people kind of trying to recover in their own way yeah um and you know certainly the largest in australia online yeah and then you know it definitely evolved into more of a technology focus which then it became an app um or the behavior change part of the organization turned into the daybreak which is you know now available for people and um so it's sort of evolved yeah because that was always one of my when i saw hello sunday morning um come out all those years ago I was like so excited because that was always one of my things being a bit younger trying to turn my life around just at the time it felt like there was none of those like new technology um, options to to engage with so um, I'm excited that you were part of bringing us into the 21st century <laughs> yeah um, you're welcome you world you're welcome <laughs> um so so yeah so but a lot of people probably i don't know or, ma or maybe you have like I i'm not sure but i don't think you've done heaps and heaps of like public facing stuff about you personally it's been more in the background building some of these um products and services which is yeah been really a lot cool. of people would disagree with that like, <laughs> okay took my own horn any chance i get <laughs> there you go so well i'm excited to kind of hear your story a little bit um and the man behind some of these some of these organizations so um, my first question always is right is most people when you talk about drugs and alcohol to them they run the other direction <laughs> so what got you interested in this space and involved in it well, I kind of find the um, the opposite is sort of true for me. Like, I think we're, you know, we're a drug using society um, yeah. and people are fascinated by how and why we use them. Um, you know, and alcohol isn't you know, very much, you know, it's the number one drug. It's the famous one. It's the <laughs> Nadal of drugs. Um, right. <laughs> I, like, I got into it, um, you know, you know, before I was born, like he, look at your yeah. family history and um you know my family um family are kind of big drinkers you know there's not there's like a few outliers that um yeah. you know didn't drink um but most people definitely drank um and a lot um 
and not to a point of the like addiction, but definitely excessive drinkers and just big part and, of the you know, big 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 drinking culture in the family. Yeah, big time. Um, yep. I t- when I told uh, my grandpa um, that I was doing hell Sunday morning, you know, when I started it in my early twenties, and took <laughs> a year off drinking, and he was like, "Why are you doing that?" And I was like, "Well, you know, there's kind of big." binge drinking culture and he's like binge drinking your mother invented it and i was like <laughs> all right well it's uh, good that i'm doing this then um but yeah i mean that's that's where i come from and like after working in the space you know with people such as yourself um and kind of you know we probably share a similar non-clinical background coming into aod um you know by the virtue of what we ended up doing um and like so i didn't so i came from that perspective um and have been fascinated with it ever since and it's a real purpose and mission of mine to work on improving service innovation and policy that can um, move the country and perhaps the world from a place where addiction is lifelong um complicated poorly treated to one where lots of people have access to really great treatment yeah awesome man awesome and you you're right i I think that's an interesting point that people forget about as well you you mentioned that we're a drug using society obviously in australia it's well talked about you know the australian drinking culture a lot of like pretty much everybody drinks or a lot of people drink yeah um, and a lot of people drink excessively um but drugs as well, like that, that's what people forget. Like there's so many people <laughs> um, that use drugs, not necessarily um, in a harmful way or, or a way that's wrecking their life, but there's heaps of people that use drugs and there is a massive fascination with it in society. And I think people forget that. It's kind of weird, you know? <laughs> Mate, we, we like, I was just on having the arm of my um, stepmom who's, um, 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 who has got COVID, right? And she was yeah. talking about her symptoms and she was like, oh, um, you know, it's been pretty mild. Like I've had this, you know, this experience, like, you know, it's, I'm really lucky that it's not, wasn't the full-blown COVID. Yeah. And like both of us like, oh, thank fuck that, you know, we're vaccinated and, you know, because I had COVID too. And similarly, like it was pretty bad, but wasn't as bad as it could be. And I say that yeah. like as, you know, we use the drug to alleviate some of those um, symptoms. And, yeah. you know, recreationally, it's the same thing. We, you know, use drugs daily. I'm drinking a tea right now. Um, you know, it's got caffeine in it. Um, and I take antidepressant medication um, every day and yeah. different points in my life. And um, the, the real challenge that people like you and i have is like how do you help people navigate their use of them so they use the right one um that's going to cause least harm but there's no opt-out like you we live in a society that we you need to use them um or need to make (laughs) informed choices on how we use them and it's about finding the right one uh for you as an individual to live the life that you want yeah and it is funny when you strip it back and you look at it um you know, you mentioned antidepressants then, uh, and then if you, yeah, you weigh some of the legal drugs uh, that you might get prescribed by the doctor, and if you just take away the labels from them and just look at like the chemical compounds in terms of how potent and powerful they are, a lot of them are the same as a illicit drug, but it's just viewed differently in society. So then it creates this whole um different way in which we approach it and think about it um it's it's just it's weird when you think about it it is really strange the relationship that society has with different drugs different substances for no good reason sometimes (laughs) yeah totally i mean i remember um like starting starting to write um a book about the culture and how we use drugs and talking to some my, my parents are both doctors so yeah. Um, talking to some of them, their friends and one of their doctor mates said to me that, you know, the only difference between a, um, a, a poison and a medicine is a do- the dose. And I think 
when we have a society that's more oriented towards that um, objective view of what is a poison for this person and what is a medicine for this poison um, and has some rigor around understanding that and the right information, um, that's a much better society than one where we just by default make them poisons yeah. and um, and that's culture. Like, And I think that culture can and is changing. Yeah, 100%. So if you don't mind me asking, you, you mentioned that um, you, t- you take antidepressants. Was, was that part of your journey into wanting to kind of get into the, yeah, like I guess you'd call drug and alcohol space. It, it is in some ways part of the mental health space as well. Was that part of it, like your own personal experiences just with internal struggles, if you want to call it that? It's, it springs from... Um like for me an intuition um with my own mind and i would say like freud has this great line which is the the price of civilization is neuroses yeah so just like drugs exist neuroses exist like anxiety depression for me um it you know is the price that my mind my brain pays um for like living the life that i do and the life that i want um and so antidepressants have come in like very handy for me um like at different points so i've had three this is my third trot on antidepressants starting in my early 20s um you know on for two years and then off and then back on them again and then off them again and on them again and i don't say that like oh you're on and off you're it's more like i just intuitively know like there comes a point um and and actually there's a there's a great reference in bruce springsteen's autobiography where <laughs> he, he comes to a similar point and his wife is like i'm going to take you a doctor and he goes to the doctor it's like get this man a pill like he needs it like you know and then bruce springsteen's like you know the world's most famous rocker like and he has these points in his life and he's a very intuitive man he's like i um need this to survive like i need this to function and to live a good life and yeah and so that that's a very similar experience for me and there's a lot of kind of trial and error and i'm lucky that the antidepressants that i take um they're called valdoxin um they're an ssri and they work on um both my serotonin but also melatonin receptors yeah. and um not that i understand the science of it but for me <laughs> i take it every day and it feels um like my life is qualitatively better yeah and um if you know my dad um who's a gp you know and really kindly one said to me like chris this is something that you'll have for the rest of your life like and i look at it like herpes like sometimes it's going to flare up you know like and i'm going to need some drugs to help me um treat it and deal with it and um function in the way i want to function so i'm very proud of my choices in terms of uh, medication yeah awesome mate awesome um so i think one of the cool things that i didn't suspect from um this show so so part of the reason why we wanted to do the podcast was obviously and you know this about me tell people's like personal stories really passionate about that getting that out there but also one of the things that's happened to me in um and i'm sure it's probably the same with you in this drug and alcohol space is just being fortunate enough to meet um i muck around and call them the big dogs but you know meet different people that come at it from different perspectives that have spent their life working on research or clinical practice in the drug and alcohol space and it's really changed the way in which i've thought about you know substance use myself my own story for the better and and to help me and i've always thought that one of the cool it would be really cool to be able to do that on at a bit more scale um and see if we can move the conversation into a different space um and one of the cool things that's happened is through talking to professionals or people like yourself that have created services or work in research or whatever we've had so much interest from people that work in the field um as someone that's kind of come 
into the alcohol and drug space from a different angle and kind of created something super substantial and become a whole new service but at the time was doing it in a very different way how do you what advice would you give to someone to actually go about doing that if they want to do something in the drug and alcohol space because so many people um that i talk to don't want to just go into like the step the standard services and that's not to bag that but you know people have their own ideas they want to do stuff what would you say to people how do they how do they get involved and was it hard did it happen quickly yeah well number one i think um it the first step is like self-awareness like why you're doing it and i think that maybe only comes with time but like in you know doing a lot of therapy um particularly towards the end of my time with Hello Sunday Morning, I really came to the realisation that a lot of what I was trying to do by building Hello Sunday Morning outside the clinical medical model was to prove my dad wrong. Like, you know, he's a DP, <laughs> very black and white, like, you know, this is how it is. And, <laughs> like, so my advice is, like, maybe you have to go on that journey um, to do that. But if you can do therapy first, um, you might come to the realisation that I have now and some principles that I have now around working with people is I only want to work with clinicians. So, like, I think for some of the challenges that we had with Hello Sunday Morning, like, we built a real, it was a real struggle to get funding and support and to build things. Um, And we had to retrofit a lot of the clinical evidence base and practice into it and it like and now the work that i do with organizations i work um with in in concert with clinical experts and it makes the process so much easier and there's some incredible um clinicians who you know like nicole lee that we work with um and in another organization that i have i work with um dr chris davis who is an expert in um, in home detox and I bit, we built a business together with him and then I, in my mental health advocacy work I work with Pat McGorry and Ian Hickey yeah. and um, there's a humbling process that I think comes to that but I have a skill which is building partnerships fundraising um, and I've learned that skill and that's not a skill that clinicians often have so my advice to someone coming at it from a different angle is you can bring a lot to the field and to help people and like in you know peer work is is like critical for that but i would strongly encourage you to work with someone that has a um they have the ticket you know they have the ticket within the system and you're going to add to that like rather than create something outside that and i know that's sort of probably counter maybe to a bit of your philosophy which i'm really you know, keen to get your and debate it with you um, if it, if you have a different point of view. Um, but just for me, I'm like, I don't need to um, push my push the boulder up that mountain um, <laughs> to prove my dad wrong. You know, like like I've made peace with my 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 dad and I made peace with why I was doing it. But like, if we really want to have, if I if I really want to have the impact I want to have on the addict like the nature of addiction in society the most effective more likely way of doing that is working with clinical experts that have the knowledge and the keys to the car that we can drive together yeah no i i agree 100 percent. i'm i'm on board with that I, I i think it's interesting what you said and thanks for being honest with that it's it's funny because that's the truth for a lot of people not just in alcohol and drugs in any kind of space that anyone goes into often there's the sort of deep psychological reasons that are (laughs) kicking around in the background that they that they might not know or might not admit to themselves so when you realized that or accepted that that's what you were doing i imagine there was some sort of shift that you had and then did at that time when you were building hello sunday morning did that um like start to go better when you like changed your approach or when you had more awareness around your own self or well first it went poorly um we (laughs) like so with hello sunday morning like um i mean let's look at it like a 10-year history yeah the first 
um, you know, four to five years was um, like building a movement. Like anyone can sign up and we'll support like a peer led movement. We'll sign up and support you um, in whatever change you want. And you can still, the essence of that is still embedded in the work that Hello Sunday Morning does. Yeah. Um, so you got a day break, you'll see people's stories and you'll see people that have similar stories around the changes they want to make and then supporting each other. And that's a lovely, lovely thing to see. But what, um, and then what happened was I went and did an MBA um, to think about, because the challenge is always like growing it. Like, how do we build a, like there were points where we lost our funding um, and had to fire the whole team. It was very traumatic. I was like, <laughs> I want to build a great um, organization that is an institution, like that will be yeah. here beyond my time with it. So that was my goal. But the challenge that arose with that was um, with the size of community, which was tens of thousands of people at that point, w- there was a lot of clinical risk there. There were a lot of people that would stop drinking and were having withdrawals, but, and, you know, services are out there to help them and maybe our mm-hmm. pieces and that, but we're like, well, they're also, that part of it is also our responsibility. We can't kind of put our head in the sand yeah. and go, oh, well, not our problem, you know, like we need to care for the community that chose us. So after coming back from the MBA, I was like, I'm going to, we are going to move towards more of treatment provision by building in a stronger evidence base, um, yeah. adding in psychologists, adding in alcohol and drug counsellors into the mix to help people with these more complicated tasks. And at that point, um, you know, where it went poorly was, um, I don't think I'd fully worked out my shit at that point um, or my piece with my dad, as I say, like, so like I brought in um, doctors and kind of like, um, and the debates that we had and like, it was a real um, rough time to try and retrofit that in. And we had like psychologists that would come in and then they quit and like, and I never like, um, there was sort of, it was like an awkward period of time. Like we did yeah. the work and we moved it and that's where a hell of Sunday morning is now, but it was like, it was maybe a necessary awkward period. Um, and probably because the clinicians that I, I trusted, um, I, um, you know, sorry, I didn't quite trust because I probably employed very um, sort of single-minded authoritative people like this is how yep. it needs to be you know, I yep. tried, you know basically tried to find my dad to bring him in and, and have the conflict <laughs> um this is like therapy now jack like i I'm love just, it i love I'm it going for it like, no, but this is and then the, it's awesome because this is the shit that happened like i i have had similar experiences in you know stuff that i've set up and whatever and speaking to other people but people don't talk about it so it's awesome mate. it's awesome yeah um and then you know, over time, it got better and better. But by the time I left Teller Sunday morning, which was about two years ago now, um, yeah. it was in it was an okay place. Like in terms of the dynamic between the technology team and the clinical team, um, or the like, the community, you know, tech kind of like, yeah, you know, the platform and the clinical team. It was all as a great amount of friction there, yeah. and that you know friction led me i was like it was sort of like a relationship that was like getting built over time but it led me to the principles that i now have which is i'll only start something if there's a clinical expert yep. um there like and they know they have built up that knowledge and i'm adding i'm like taking their work and expanding it um as yep. opposed to well, i've got an idea around um this piece of aod and i'm going to start it like i just haven't got the appetite for that anymore like <laughs> um it is hard work much. isn't it yeah it's hard work like and in a way kind of ego driven like you know which yeah. is, I just exactly what i did yeah. um and moreover there are so many fucking awesome clinicians that have spent like care about this problem in the same way they want to do something about it but their uh, worldview is like one-to-one like this you know work one-to-one and then yeah. but there's an intuition that this could be bigger like this could be systematic change and that's why i love people like nicole because she thinks like that and then she needs people like you and me to come in and go well how do we operationalize that um and how do we build a program that that does that and so that for me has been a you know a big kind of hard fought lesson to get to yeah awesome mate no i love that and everybody 
That is not a beer or anything. That is sparkling water. I just feel like I have to clarify because I've been buying these cans of sparkling water because I just, I don't know, love it, drink it. And people keep asking me, is that beer? But anyway. And this is not a tea. This is vodka. <laughs> um, so that's really cool. It's, it's, um, it's, I appreciate you just like kind of going there and un- unpacking it. So just to give everybody an idea though, because I am conscious. I, I feel like you may like Sunday morning, uh, Sunday morning, hello, Sunday morning is now like something pretty, pretty big. So when you finished there two years ago or now, I'm sure you're still in touch with the guys and whatever. Um, what, what kind of, like numbers of people use the use the app and engage in the services for support and stuff like that. So now um, talking to the um, the new CEO Andy, um, he says there's a hundred thousand people using Daybreak, um, which yeah. is amazing. Like, and we we're also able to navigate as as a part of like building in a stronger evidence base and kind of legitimizing the behavior change model um, through a lot of research and evaluation um, to get, uh, we have like, Hello Sunday Morning has a multi-year government contract um, to make it free for all Australians that that need support. So that came as a result of that pivot. Um, But the size of it is, you know, huge. Like, um, and, you know, for your listeners, I encourage you to download Daybreak and, even if you don't need it for yourself, just to see the, the sort of tenor of the community and how it is so supportive and the model of care. And you can literally, you know, immediately talk to a counsellor and then, you know, if you need to, a psychologist. And it's very accessible for people um, that are dealing with these problems. And that was always the, the vision for it. Um, but, you know, when you compare, so there's, there's um, from AA, there's sort of 20,000 or so people in the country that are members of AA in Australia. And those numbers are sort of hard to pin down. But when you compare that, you know, to 100,000 people, um, it's a much larger group of people, uh, much more diverse um, kind of relationships with alcohol and relationships with themselves that lead to different relationships with alcohol. So. It's a, it's a huge sort of scale um, of community. Yeah, awesome. And uh, I think, you know, that that's just, it's just good for people to know that as well because when you're explaining it, <laughs> yeah, it's it's not just like you help to build this like small little service. It's, it's a massive, it's a massive service that's having huge impact. So roughly how long did it take you to, to build it? Was it like 10 years to get it to that stage or t- a little bit under or? Yeah, well, we had, um, when, when I, when we kicked it off 2000, I think I did my year, my first year of not drinking in 2009. And then the first year in 2010, we had five people. Um, and at that point it was a blog and people would sign up for three months of not drinking and, you know, share their experience, you know, yeah. five of my friends really. Um, that wanted to do that too and it wasn't I didn't start it originally to for other people to do it um, but then my housemate one day was like hey would you mind if I like blog on there too and I was like initially I was like nah man this is my thing like, you know <laughs> I'm, I don't want you to like and then but I changed he you know convinced me um, to do it and I'm thankful that he did because as soon as there was like two it's like oh there's two different stories here and it's like and that in life, like the story is the thing, like the story is what matters, like how you change your story. And then that became more interesting. And then, you know, people that I didn't know signed up and that was like, you know, kind of year three and that grew to like 150 people. And yep. then journal, like Jill Stark um, kind of. Oh yeah, a, we had her, we had her on the podcast. She's awesome. Yeah. So she, she got like, it sort of like started to get a little bit of media at that point um and jill covered it in this story and did her own 12 months of not drinking and she blogged on hell sunday morning too so that's how she got in there and her story you know um then led to her book like so the publisher 
a publisher was like, oh, we want to, you know, and she's sort of gone on and um and and done that. But that gave it the profile, and it kind of grew into the, the thousands. And the vision was to get to ten thousand by two thousand thirteen, which is um what we did. And then and then it kind of keep kept growing, and then um yeah, it sort of just it's it's not like a um you know an exponential growth. It's just sort of like sort of like doubling and doubling and doubling and like keeps it just sort of keeps going and yeah probably last sort of few years um growth has been less important to um kind of service fidelity and improving improving the experience of people and managing risk and um and so you know it doesn't need to have you know a billion people like it's not a social media platform it's a yep. it is a service you know that that there's a kind of niche group of people that need this help so how do we you know capture all of them and make sure that that you know this is one of their um tools and the toolkit for their own recovery yeah so mate it's so cool and my my biggest question is because this is something that like i've learned over the time that i think people kind of forget about is whether people pay for it or it's funded by the government or whatever, someone's paying for it, right? Whether it's the taxpayer or it's the, uh, or it's people out of their own pocket or whatever. So yeah, you, you mentioned at the, at the start, like kind of funding it was the hardest thing. How did you, how did you go about, yeah, working out how to get it funded and what would you suggest is the best way for people to to kind of get something off the ground if they want to if they want to do something because i literally have so many people contact me and go really want to do this really want to do that how do i get money how do i charge you know and it's just like i don't know <laughs> like my advice for that would be if you don't enjoy asking for money you need to be working with someone that does um yeah so like find a partner um or someone that is good at asking for money and there's lots of people out there and i'm not that i've kind of got better at it over time but in the beginning i was good enough to at it at asking for money um and pitching things to um you know to get it going but then i wasn't good enough um at following up and like the kind of real grind um, that sales people really love or like, you know, yeah. fundraising people really love. And so when, you know, we went through, we had like, I got a grant um, and then. Um, so was that the main way you got it funded? You got all grants at the pretty much at the start? Yeah. Like um, the first bit of money when it was a blog, um came like and i was still working in advertising at the time yeah and the advertising agency had prison city council as a client and um you know this is when like binge drinking was a big kind of like you know binge drinking was like the thing that we needed to fix in our society so like there was a cultural kind of point that people were interested in this as a thing yeah and then we went into the ceo's the ceo of um, britain city council's office and like no one wanted to fund a blog um about one advertising dude not drinking um <laughs> like you know like it wasn't the like, you know but we asked you know and and so went in there and the ceo and you just have like a lucky break sometimes and the ceo's like the, the you know the bureaucrat was like well we're not gonna you know do this like and for good reason like I, you know i didn't expect them and then see i was like nah nah find this guy some money like you know give him 20 grand or whatever it was and you just find advocates like that that just see a good idea and they'll back it and they're out there like and you need a bit of luck there and that was the first bit of money that came in and then i started um i was like i decided that this is what i want to do with my life so there's a good kind of um boat burning moment I think that can happen if you really care about something where you kind of have to make it into an income and um so that point I like started selling to um universities so I was like in my early 20s and they're like oh this is dude that kind of you know um and I like you know encourages people to take a break from drinking and he's in his 20s like that's a you know novelty and so I pitched 
to universities to come and like I'll come and give a talk and like talk about Hello Sunday morning and so I made like an income doing that, um, going into universities and telling them to take a break from drinking, which is quite <laughs> a lot of confidence um, at that point. But anyway, needed to eat. And then, um, so then that then evolved. Um, Queensland Health were like, um, all right, we'll, we'll fund it, but you have to be a non-profit. Like, so yep. then that moved to Sunday morning from kind of a sort of pseudo company structure into a non-profit so that we could get a grant from Queensland Health to um, do some more work with them. And then like, mate, there so many different, like them, you know, then sort of ran out of money or I ran out of money and had to fire the five people that were you know, like, we sort of built up the point. And then the next guy that I hired um, was a guy called Jamie Moore and he is fucking awesome at, um, fundraising and partnerships like he's the best but like, yeah. I'm, I'm okay but like and together over the you know the ensuing sort of eight years we like when like um you know just kept building partnerships with people and growing it and like getting a lot of rejections like and you have to be comfortable with that um for people like you know, some we laugh and it was good doing it in a partnership because we laugh about the rejection ones, like you know, going and meeting the community managers at NRL and pitching Hell like a, a partnership with Hell Sunday morning and like just the fucking grimaces on their face. And they're like, <laughs> We have alcohol sponsors, like, and like it was like, you know, any questions? <laughs> I guess we'll just, yeah, you guys, fuck off. um, that's funny, it's like. Uh, but like you know doing that is fun man like you know when you do it with in partnership the fundraising bit you think people see it as like daunting but it's just asking you know like yes yeah. and you just have to be comfortable and make be curious about the rejections and not like take it personally and a lot of people rejected us in the early days that then became funders in the future and the funders for the shit that i'm doing now like yeah. it's not a um you know, it's not a personal thing. There's timing and, but like you focus on the relationship, but you've got to ask and, you know, no one's going to hand it to you. And yeah. and if you complain about that, like you, you're wasting your breath. Like, I, lo- I love that, mate. And I'm glad that we fleshed that out because that's the, that's the thing is that it, it is, it is difficult and it takes time and it's a bit of, it's, it's hard work, but you just got to be persistent. Right. And just kind of, ask people for, for help totally yeah. you never know like what you and jack for your listeners like jack and i are working on a, on a proposal now to do a, a peer-led kind of support program um and we're at the very beginning like what a proposal looks like i starting to talk to people there's a good chance it won't come off there's a chance that it will and that's yeah. all we need to go for like talk to people and find the opportunity and build it and that's how all things start like you just you can't um like two things like don't you gotta you gotta put something together and you gotta put it in front of people and ask them if they're interested and there's so many things so many ideas and partnerships and stuff that haven't come off um and it's just important not to take it personally and like you know there's plenty of good ideas and like just you know you need to have a bit of luck opportunity and the confidence and curiosity around what you know what a no might look like and when you get that it's like you know who cares like it's not don't take it personally yeah that's right awesome mate so what are you what are you doing now Do, tell us about the clean clean slate clinic um and uh you know how that all works uh and then i'm and then i'm gonna ask you the uh the big tough questions after that (laughs) all right sweet um well my purpose in life is um to do to contribute my skills to australia so that we move from a country where one in 20 people have a daily addiction to one in a hundred um and that is um you know that requires policy change and it requires innovative um service development so that when people do have an addiction it's brief intervened early and really well treated um and as a culture we see addiction as being part of being human like cancer 
you know, and it's just, you just get great treatment when it happens and it's inevitable. Um, yeah. And so the work that I'm doing now and where I've come to land is I love doing a portfolio of things um, that are working on different parts of the problem with people that I really love and respect. Um, and so um, my kind of um, two main or three main jobs at the moment, um, one is helping 360 Edge, um, which is a consultancy focused on improving the AOD sector, um, which is a really niche consultancy that helps people, helps services and helps government in, like bring their drug and alcohol policy into you know this century and, and like across companies and um, so my job there is around partnerships and trying to in, improve and grow that work. Um, my other job is um, running an advocacy movement called Australians for Mental Health, which is focused on mental health reform. So every election and budget to improve mental health advocacy for people with lived experience so that there's more money available and treatment's better for people that need help. And then the third one is a company that I started with um, a GP called Chris Davis, who is, um, you know, a world leading expert in GP led home detox. So for people that want to do um, alcohol or drug withdrawal from home rather than go to a rehab or hospital. Um, and he's built a really great clinical model there. And so with him and our CEO of that organization, Pierre Clinton Tarras, that used to be the ex head of healthcare at Deloitte and as a health economist, the three of us have taken that model and put it into a telehealth model. And so um, we, for that business, we work with PHNs, so like the, um, you know, government organisations that want to fund um, detox places affordably for people that want to do it at home and can and are suitable for it, but also insurers that want to offer that as an alternative for their members um, rather than, you know, going to a hospital to do the detox. If they want to do it at home, they can do that. And then individuals that want to pay for it privately um, but don't want to spend tens of thousands of dollars on the, for the privilege. So um, we, you know, are sort of growing slowly. And, um, and so, yeah, so they're my, like, little portfolio of things that I'll, you know, add to, take away, um, you know, as needed. Um, but the, the sort of vision and purpose for me is really clearly around improving you know, the system for as many people as I can. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Awesome. So you're obviously someone that's um, kind of uh, free spirited, entrepreneurial, uh, wants to kind of bring new and innovative services, as you said, in, into the space. So coming at it from that angle and all the stuff that you're doing now, like what do you think needs to change in the whole system reform because would you agree that it's kind of not quite working in its current <laughs> in its current evolution well all things are working but it's who they're working for yeah, um, yeah, yeah so here's what like and i'm actually thinking about going back and studying another year doing a master's in policy or something because i really want to understand how to affect um better policy reform but um my thinking is like, to achieve that vision. Let's say, let's say that the number is um, moving from one in 20 to one in a hundred. We have to do the kind of reforms that we've done in tobacco control um, across all drugs of addiction. Um, and that means kind of finding a new equilibrium around how we uh, sell, promote, um, provide access to um, drugs that are you know habit forming and so there's a lot of uh, policy change that needs to happen like I don't I think that um, drugs of addiction shouldn't have the license to advertise um, and I think they should be hard to get um, and require people to really consider their choices but they should also be available I don't believe in prohibition I think that um, I think we need policies that maximize individual choice but minimize um, collective harms yeah so you know the vision for that on the like um sort of the policy level is that um you know 
things are available and we constantly change and tweak the availability of them and how we um, promote them and sell them in a society um, according to the levels of harms to get to that point where fewer people um, you know that that are risk that are, have a potential for harm have access to them and then on the other side we also need um, ubiquitous um, very attractive amazing therapy and treatments for people you know when you do get and inevitably will get in a spot of harm and so when um and for me that it is things like doubling the capacity of the uh, mental health workforce and aod workforce like making sure that people in that field there's a lot of people to help people with these growing problems and we over invest in it as a society yeah. and um, and that also means that um, I keep doing research into new ways of treating the mind, like psychedelic assisted therapy or digital therapeutics. And like, and as a society, we're proud of that, that work and keep on work um, building new models of like peer care and how that works with different people. And so that everyone has someone to turn to or someone somewhere to go. Um, and then, you know, in the clinical model side, like we need to reimagine um, primary care to orient it towards mental health and addiction. Like if that's the gate that people come through in the model system, like how do we spend more time helping people with, um, you know, finding the right medication for them or medication review, like, you know, that kind of clinical interaction with a person's mind. And so there's a lot that can be done. Like a lot of things could actually have a significant impact. And if you take tobacco as one example, um, you know, 50 years ago, one in two people smoked daily, like right? one in two adults smoked daily. And now it's one in 10, which still seems like a lot of like, it's like a big challenge, but okay, well, how do we just 10X that? And then with the other kind of um, problems of addiction, like in alcohol, like how do we like, progressively change policies so that fewer people have a daily consumption of it um and that if they are consuming the, the product daily which normally is a, often a, i mean unless it's like small amounts often indicated that there's something else that needs treated how do we really help encourage them to find that treatment as yeah. quickly as possible and when they're ready um and i think that there's a lot there to be done so one question i have interesting around your your thinking around it is you know they're heavily related but separated out mental health system and the aod system um and i can't remember the the um figures but everybody acknowledges that the aod system in particular is like heavily under um funded and capitalized right uh, and mental health probably the same but in the last i don't know five six seven years there's been lots more like money come in why despite lots more money coming into the mental health does the problem seem to kind of be getting worse and people more than ever seem to kind of be complaining about the services and how they're delivered you know like how did i guess for the aod system from how you see it and because you do the advocacy in in both like you said like like how do you stop that from happening in aod um in the future hopefully <laughs> or or what needs to change in the mental health and or do you agree with that you know that there's more money than ever but it seems that things are worse i just don't think it's enough like yeah and and maybe honestly maybe it'll never be enough like yeah. maybe like like i've gone back to what freud said like the price of civilization is neuroses and like we're only becoming more civilized like we're only getting more things that make us anxious like social media change in like global pandemics climate change like no like dollar spent on mental health or addiction is a bad dollar to be spent like i mean yeah what better thing in your own life or as a system can you optimize for which is helping people make sense and peace with their existence like um for me it like well like the the trope that oh we've spent all this money and like nothing's happened well like it's 
<laughs> the problem's fucking huge, like for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And it needs tens of billions of dollars more to build a system that is effective for a population that's only becoming more anxious and more depressed. And like, it's not their fault. It's just, that's the, the times that we live in. And so I think, I mean, the AOD mental health system today, it's beyond my pay grade. I don't really understand it. Um, <laughs> like I just see people that need help, like people that need support and, um, you know, whatever door you go into, if, like, for me, success is like you go into a door and someone takes care of you and, you know, you, you put on a path towards the recovery towards the, and we all go through it, like towards the path you want to be on, like whether that's a AOD worker or a counselor or a peer worker or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, like whatever. Like, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. It matters to a lot of people and a lot of people that I work with. Um, yeah. And, and maybe for good reason, but I just sort of have a, um, philosophy that is I just want to help see systems that help more people like, and like um, and I think diagnoses are often like I love my depression diagnosis it's useful because I can navigate my life yeah um, and but and I think that's where the value is on a personal level um, you know, for your own life but like saying that you know we only treat people that have this diagnosis and like maybe that's useful but i don't know it's just i don't really care for it so yeah maybe that's naive i don't know yeah yeah it's no nah, it's it's interesting um i i just think there's there's got to be a point where not not where you say it's enough don't get me wrong i'm not <laughs> i i'm all for more money flowing in but I do, I do get worried that, because to me, when I talk to people, and maybe it's just me thinking about it cynically, that you know care about the space and want to do stuff. Sometimes it just feels like everybody's yelling, like "Just give me more money," <laughs> and it's like, at what point the there has to be like some acknowledgement that things have to change on some level to get better outcomes with that money you know like so for instance i nearly fell off my chair i didn't know this but a, a little while ago um we were going through uh, uh i was talking to someone about the um the national ice action strategy that and there was like i can't remember how much money but there was quite a bit of money that got funded into that and there was no um there was no like outcome set up in that whole package so there was basically just all this money given to this thing with no kind of north star about <laughs> what you wanted it to achieve and then so you get to the end of like six years or whatever and it sort of can't be evaluated because there's no <laughs> we're just like kind of stabbing just stuff like that just blows me away um yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's just probably lessons to be learned about governance there, but man, it's just money. Like we're talking about people's lives. Like yeah, a government says, oh, I'll, well, I'll put $10 billion into helping people with methamphetamines and, you know, half of that works for people. Half of it gets us great. Like, yeah, I don't care. Like, I think, um, like it's it's complicated to um, like to move your mind into an abstraction of an, you know twenty five million people um, impossible even I think for a human brain to understand so like we track it back down to what we know and often that's like the economics of it um, <laughs> and. But like, I mean, this is sort of, yeah, my stuff in mental health. I was like, I think we, I will like, I don't think, like if you have um, a dollar to spend somewhere, like, and you donate it to uh, an AOD facility, I don't think that there's, like the, 
I think the concept of like trying to, well, how are you spending that? What are you, you know, kind of doing it on? Um, I don't know. I'm sort of more of just like a more is better guy when it comes to spending money on treatment and mental health. Like I think there's nothing, yeah. there's no better investment that we can make, even if some of that investment isn't, um, you know, it, it, I like definitely encourage like good governance and good evaluation for it. Um, but the challenge I think, and with that um, feedback would be, um, I think when, if we as a sector just become critical of how we as a society spend money and try and pick holes in it, um, I think that's important, but we have to couch it in the view that actually it's a good thing that we're doing. Like, it's good that we as a society want to help people with methamphetamine addiction, even if like all the yeah. money goes there and everyone just goes, well, we're doing methamphetamine addiction and we're actually helping people with alcohol because that's how government and politics moves. <laughs> yeah. Um, so well done. Like, you know, for me, I'm like, <laughs> awesome. Put the money in there. Like, well done. Maybe we should consider like better government stru- governance structures and evaluation for it. Or maybe we should put, you know, the next, investment of tranche that you do let's do it there like um starting from that perspective is like because the alternative is why do you give all this money you know coming from the set why do you give all this money to the sector and how do you know like where it went and if i'm a politician that doesn't give a shit about this stuff i'm not going to go oh we should do that again like we're going to get yeah. like beaten up by people from the sector like um you know like you one no nah, well, this is you know, put our money in wind farms and you know, coal mines and stuff like, you know, where then they're, they're not going to be critical of how we gave it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a bit of a. Whole no, 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 I know what you mean. Uh, it, it's good. It's good. It, it's, it's part of why I, I bring these things up because I'm interested in, in people's perspectives. So um, the, the last question I had, which is always a, <laughs> a, a contentious one a little bit as well is uh and i don't know if you said with clean slate clinic i think you did that people can pay for it privately like what what kind of um uh what kind of place do private providers hold in this whole um space and do you think there needs to be stuff that changes there or or um there needs to be more involvement from private providers. Yeah, like what? What's your thoughts on that? Insurers, you mean? Or no, like uh, I guess like fee for service, um, services. So uh, I, I don't know if Clean State Clinic does that, but yeah, like people come yeah. and and they pay, you know, out of their own pocket, or they pay a percentage out of their pocket, and they're covered by health insurance or whatever it is you know stuff yeah. like that because like there's a there's a there's a segment of people that i talk to that just believe that private providers shouldn't exist at all <laughs> you yeah. know in this in this space do you think like what do you think the balance is with that where does it where does it begin and end and is there more is there more of a role to play for private providers yeah, I mean, I'll work with anyone. Like, yeah. someone wants to help help us um, help more people live a better life and get into recovery, or like, you know, detox for a week. Um, I optimize for that principle. So, like, if if insurers are going to help us help more of them, and it's good for their members, and it's more affordable, um, fantastic. If the government wants to do it awesome if a person wants to pay for the service rather than you know wait six months to get into a facility we'll do we'll take their money and and i know that we do with the value um so our private the, the price that it costs to go privately through our detox service is three grand yeah and i know that like that'll be the best three grand that a person that's had a daily addiction for 10 years um will ever spend like they'll spend that multiples on alcohol and the problems associated with it and family relationships and all that stuff like so i've no um qualms about charging it's really affordable um and that's roughly the same price it's a bit cheaper for public for 
um, sort of government clients um, and they buy bulk um, sort of things. But yeah, uh, it's I, I'm I'm more of like this is the system that we have, and I'm like. I want to change the system, but not that bit. Like, I don't. I want yeah. to change the kind of addiction thing, but like how things are paid for. Um, I'm, I, as long as I can get the money to do like the work that my teams do, I don't really care. Like, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good. It's just um, it's uh, and the part of the reason why I ask, right, is because I do private stuff as well and have in the past, and it's this weird thing that I went through it took me ages to kind of overcome it was like this i don't know i just felt bad (laughs) you know like charging people in a time of need or whatever um and it took me quite a while to and talking to different people and all that to like get my head in that space of well though this is actually valuable um and the reason why i ask is because there's a lot of other people that struggle with that too that want to do stuff have a different way of thinking about their service or whatever um have qualifications want to charge for it um but then yeah like struggle with it and you know struggle with uh uh feedback that they get from other people and and stuff like that you know so it's it's interesting yeah yeah it's it is a challenge for sure hey mate i really appreciate you coming on um and just like kind of telling us about your experience and i hope that's helpful for people listening to uh to you know if they want to do something a bit different that you can do it um and that there is a pathway there so appreciate it mate appreciate appreciate all the cool things you've done as well so um i'll put all the links to the different things that chris is involved in in the show notes and uh if you want to follow up with him and hassle him you can uh find him there (laughs) awesome cheers jack you're doing great work mate Have a good day. See ya.